OK, so Lady Humanos, what is it? Um, going to start off with an introduction to Lady Humanos project. Lady Humanos is a European funded project. It is funded by Horizon Europe and we as the UK partners are funded by UKRI Interstate UK project. So this is how we as organisations can continue to benefit from the cross European research um, through the Horizon project um, and so it's very good of the UKRA to support us. The project itself is as you can see quite a complex one. We actually have 21 different institutions involved in this project. There are 15 direct partners um, the eight in eight EU countries and also in Pakistan. Um, the two associated partners are ourselves and Reading University. Um, and there are also four other affiliated entities, organisations who are part of this project. So it's quite a complex one run by the University of Florence um, with other countries heavily involved. And the hypothesis behind the project, the rationale, is that we have multi-species assemblages of plants deliver rise of various functions that are greater the sum of all parts. The belief that a higher plant density, diversity in intercropping systems increases plant health, leading to a reduction in pesticides. Some of that obviously will be due to the interrelationship between plants, different species, meaning disease and pest spreads are slower. That increasing plant health results in increasing below ground networks, which we now mm -hmm. begin to understand is much more significant. Um, and therefore the reduction of fertilizer inputs and better nutrient cycles mean that we get these benefits from the plants either through allelopathy, through nutrient transfer and even though we're not totally clear on that basis of this we know that wheat crops are using nitrogen from the beans even though in theory conceptually it could be quite difficult. So the whole concept is to make more diversity, better co-occurrence, better plant and healthier plants. The way we're doing this in the UK is in two ways. There are research groups happening in six different universities, one of which is Reading University, as you can see on this in Italy, Spain, Germany, um, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Egypt and Pakistan. We also have on farm field labs, so at least 20 field trials in each country. So farmers are doing trials of their own in these countries um, as part of this project. The combined knowledge from all of those 180 trials should increase the knowledge and experience. And these trials in the UK are based around a very simple basic structure whereby we have a strip of the two monocultures within the field. We have a strip of the intercrop and we just require from the farmers who want to be involved. Um, the um, yield data, yield samples and soil samples from each of the three plots. Very simple to manage from a farmer point of view. Farmer have total control of what varieties, what species, drilling dates, everything else. So there's no sort of restrictions on what you do. And the idea being that we can get the replication by having the number of farms that are involved. It's this simple, OK? Um, so we've had some field labs already in Germany, um, and this is the basis of it. Um, if anyone is interested in being involved in the trials as a farmer, please let me know. Um, we've always got opportunity for more people to be joined into it. Um, in the UK, unusually because it's a UK funded project, we do actually pay for your involvement because of the aggravation. So what are the benefits of intercropping? Why are we doing this? Why are we having this meeting? Well, we know we get greater on-farm diversity. We know we have more resilient cropping systems through intercropping. We know there are potential higher yields and quality in the fields, not of individual species, but of the field as a whole. And we know, and a very significant one with the price and of, of fertilizer, the, the issues associated with nitrogen fertilizer, we know that we, by using pulses in the rotation, we'd re, reduce reliance on nitrogen fertilizer. <coughs> but we know from um, a workshop and a webinar, a workshop and a session we held at Ben's Farm, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, the challenges and barriers that we're getting as a consequence is, is what do we do with this mixed agronomy within the field? 
is there enough knowledge within the farming community, um, within the advisor area of how to deal with intercropping, particularly with questions that we have that relate to pesticide use, fertilizer rates, drilling dates, crops, species. We've got a problem when we combine or when we harvest. Is that is there an issue with cross contamination? Um, can we have gluten free pulses when they've been grown in the same field as as um, as wheat? And then we've got to look at the end user and market opportunities, because if we're going to grow these com mixed combinable crops, who's going to buy them? Are people going to be paying a premium or a bonus? Um, is there a supply chain into, for example, the, the livestock feed market um, because it's bringing in protein so we can reduce the, bulk, the, the need for soya? So these are all areas that we need to investigate. And part of the purpose behind this project and meetings like this is to try and look into those challenges and barriers and see if we can break some of them down or make them less significant. Equally significant in the UK um, is that we have got funding in through the SFI um, scheme through the IPM3 for intercropping within our systems. Payment of £55 a hectare. Um, for a serial cropping. And this is the rules as written from the SFI book. OK, so it basically says you must establish the companion crop on land entered, so it's growing with a main arable horticultural crop. The very vague and loose definition of, of whether you're doing it or not is that the crop does not have to be present for the full growing period as long as it's managed in a way that, and here's the, the, the very loose phrase under SFI, reasonably be expected to achieve the action's aim. And you can establish this by trap cropping, intercropping, um, and under sowing. And the objective here is to support an IPM approach by using a trap crop for pests, provide a habitat, particularly for pollinators and natural mm -hmm. crop pest predators, and therefore it's an IPM strategy, manage nutrient efficiency, protect soil and improve its condition. This can also in the UK context be associated, linked up with the IPM4 option, which is a no insecticide option. So it's, we don't expect to use an insecticide in an intercrop crop, and so we're also getting paid for doing it, which is really positive. So there are some benefits we have now in the UK through intercropping being supported by policy. And where do we get the benefits here? We mentioned, I mentioned earlier that we get higher yields, with reality being, and I've stolen these slides from um, a previous presentation, um, we know that with intercrops, we tend to get a higher yield per unit area from the intercrop than we would from the two individual crops grown together. So, and then land equivalent ratio is the one that's used. And so we can see this is some research done at Reading University by David Casebo. And land equivalent ratio is 1.2 up to almost as far as 1.5 times the yield from the mixed crops than we would have had from the two individuals. Equally significant is how this can be used to manipulate crop um, quality. Um, quality in the UK, particularly with wheat, is often defined as whether or not it, it satisfies the requirement for milling standards. Um, and here we can see that with a different range of wheat and bean proportions, we do get um, an increase in wheat protein. And if that difference is between wheat protein being good enough for milling spec to get the premium or not, um, that's obviously a very positive benefit economically from using intercropping as part of our system. Lower yields of wheat, and as we'll see in the next couple of slides, but higher potential income. And so that's something that you need to be looking at because all of these practices have to be justified economically. As part of this also project, we will also be trying to develop a modelling um, programme using remote sensing and modelling so that we can actually get some decision making support for intercropping, decide which is the correct sort of crops to be growing in which sort of regions, because one of the biggest comments that we get is that people have tried intercropping and often it's not necessarily using the, the, the ideal species mixes and we want to try and find out what is working. And arguably, if the changes that are predicted through climate change, and we've obviously had some very heavy rainfall in the north, this, in the last week um, and um, 
if we are going to be having changes of weather patterns, how can we adapt to be using the correct species for what is a slightly unpredictable future? So I mentioned we're running some trials. A couple of farms this year have already um, had trials because they were able to drill after we started the project. And I'm just going to talk through quickly through the results from the first farm. This was in Dorset. Um, a, it was a spring wheat and spring bean intercrop. The spring wheat was a three way blend, um, which is his normal. It was drilled on the 4th of August uh, of April and it was harvested on the 25th of August. Because it was grown for a specific contract, which was wild farmed, there was no herbicide, fungicide or insecticide use and it was zero and applied, but it wasn't organic. OK, so previous treatments um, such as glyphosate to clean up the stubble, it was direct drilled, um, means that it was fed into a different marketplace than the organic one. So the results from this one off trial, um, as we can see, there was an increase yield on the intercrop above that of the wheat control, a very small yield of about um, 2%. Um, and where we've got intercrop one was the trial plot, but he'd actually had the whole field into the intercrop. So we've got the data, data for the whole field bulk sample as well. Relatively yields is we can see that of the two crops, although we had about four tonne per hectare of wheat um, and we had about 2.5 tonnes a hectare of beans, the wheat production in the intercrop was just under three tonnes. So we had lower wheat yield, but we had a higher total yield for the whole field. But equally significant, as we can say, we have had an uplift of the protein levels within the wheat. Um, graph does make it look a lot bigger than it is. It's a very slight increase, not enough to reach it up to milling spec, but it certainly demonstrates that we can get this increased protein level within this. Now, yields are very interesting. This is all very interesting, but we need to look at money because if this isn't economically viable, we really, it's not something that is going to be kept going forward on. Um, so looking at uh, the results, and I said this was this was sold to a particular contract. I don't know what the prices for that contract were, so I've taken the wheat and the bean prices from the Farmers Weekly from this from Friday. So they are literally spot prices, um, and we can see that income from the wheat was about seven hundred pounds per hectare. Income from the beans was about six hundred, but the combined income from the intercrop was getting close to eight, just over eight hundred for the whole main field. So we have an increase of income of about a hundred pounds per hectare as a result of doing this. We're not counting into this any production costs, the cost of separation if it was necessary. However, had we grown this crop to be an animal food, as a for a dairy farm, for example, the mixed crop was actually a 15.9% crude protein mixture. So that has a value for a dairy farmer um, that's worth considering as part of a whole farm system. Okay, that's that's everything I was going to say to introduce all this. I'd like to hand over now to Ben. Um, when we started up this project, Ben contacted us to say he was doing some intercropping. Could he join in? Um, we then found that what he was doing was so complex and exciting that we actually wanted to spend more time looking at what he was doing. We arranged um, a, a farm walk there back in June to look around. A lot of farmers would have seen that and Ben's been very active on social media. So I'm going to unshare. Ben is going to, Laura's going to click Ben's on, if you can do that, Laura, and we will um, go through Ben's presentation. So, Ben. All right, we'll just wait for Laura to get that all sorted. Can you hear me OK? Is that all good? Yep, all good. Perfect. So morning, everyone. Name's Ben Adams. As Jerry said, I have done some quite wacky trials this year. Um, this was funded through the School of Sustainable Food and Farming as part of a net zero competition that I won. This was kind of my solution to net zero, I suppose, or basically how I span it to get the funding. Um, so what I've done is 
three years of intercropping are going to be. Can we go to the next slide? I can't remember what the first slide is. Yeah, so this is this is the first year. All the different trials I've got in this first year. So they've all been harvested now and following this we will go into a winter wheat crop for one year. And then after that, there will be an overwinter cover crop and then again followed by more trials in the third year. So if we can go to the next slide. So this is just showing the different rates of. Basically all the different trials, so the nine different plots. The plots are all spring sown. You can see the 18th and 19th of April. Um, and then we kind of divided the two fields into kind of a field that would suit earlier drilling. So that was mostly beans and oats, that field on the left, um, and then a field that would suit slightly later drilling or more frost susceptible. So stuff like peas and mustard on the right hand side. Um, and as you can see, they didn't get drilled to the 18th and 19th because we had a wet spring. Um, so the beans and oat field on the left did suffer a little bit due to that later drilling, but it is what it is. You've got to expect these things. So um, as you can see, everything was sown with a legume. That was the plan because there's no nitrogen applied. The only input throughout the whole year was a glyphosate of the cover crop um, pre pre drilling effectively. Um, and then they've basically just been left the whole way through until harvest. Uh, to make it a little bit more complicated, the main crops in the trials, as you can see down in the bottom, are variety mixes. So the beans, oats, barley and peas, they're all a three way variety mix as well, just to add that further diversity and just make things a little bit more complicated, because why not? Um, I'm a firm believer in variety mixes. All of our wheat this year is in some form of variety mix. And that's the main cash crop on the farm. So I must think it works or I'd be mad. Uh, next slide, please. So I am a full time consultant as well as farmer, so I like to do the numbers and I like to make sure that everything is there. So I've got all the variable costs on the right and effectively the operational costs as well, just to show you. Um, so going from columns left to right, that was the cover crop, that pounds per hectare of the cover crop seeds, um, then the glyphosate application, then you've got the seeding rate and the seed costs. As you can see, the seed costs were quite high because the majority of it was all bought in seed, um, and that really makes up most of the variable costs. And I will be doing in my when I go into my third year, I will be doing a lot more home saving of seeds, so I should bring that down a fair bit. Um, and then you can see just the operational cost, and that's all that's been done is one spray, two drills, obviously for the cover crop, and then the roll. The cover crop wasn't rolled, um, just the just the trials. So next slide, please, Laura. So another thing while I'm interested in intercrops, obviously, as Jerry has said, there is some lovely payments available and you can see those top four payments, the companion cropping, no insecticide, winter cover and the assessing soil. Those would all be applicable for the trials that I have done this year. So that's £235 a hectare plus what I've done at the moment. And then the two at the bottom is what we're expected to be released in 2024. And this is the kind of price guide that was given in um, some guidance a few months ago. What they, specifics of those, we don't really know, uh, but that is just a rough guide. So it shows you what can be done without even having a crop in the ground, really, without even the harvest. Um, and as you can see down the, oh, sorry, someone's speaking. Thought it might have been a question. Um, and as you can see down in the bottom right, those are just the sponsors. Oh. Um, next slide, please. So this is the first plot, the beans, oats and oilseed rape. Um, one of two of the three way mixes. Uh, I thought it was going to be really good, but as you can see right at the bottom of the picture, a small little oilseed rape 
and basically it's a bit of a common theme throughout the trials but the spring obviously drape was a disaster because it decided to start flowering again in i think it was late july august so it was a bit of a pain and i won't be going with obviously drape again um next slide so then again we got the beans and oc drape and plot two um this again did very well from a kind of through the establishment phase as you can see the oc drape at the bottom looks relatively healthy obviously been nibbled a little bit but not a lot uh but as this plot went on it did get quite weedy um was just quite noticeably a lot more thistles in this plot compared to the others and as there was no herbicide was fairly green towards harvest next please So vetching oats, um, this did fairly well. I think it was quite an easy one. There was very little weeds in this because it was quite um, oat dominated. The vetch was not planted thick enough. We had a bit of an issue with the calibration on the drill. You might be able to see from the photos, but one, one six meter strip due to the drill was drilled quite heavy. And that did yield very well, but it was quite an expensive bit with all the vetch seed that went into it. Um, so for the rest of the trials, the vetch did have to go on a little bit lighter than was expected. Um, but maturity wise with the vetch, it was probably suited a bit better to go with barley because it was it was probably early, a little bit earlier than the oats were. Um, but still got managed to get most of them in the tank and was very clean, which was good next plot next slide sorry so then beans and oats this is a, a classic favorite often called boats um so this was this is the last plot in this um field here so this was drilled on the balance the balance of the field so this did have a this was included with the headland so we'll we'll suffer a bit of a yield penalty there um but yeah again it performed really well oats seemed really healthy as well as the beans did i mean they look very healthy there can't see a spot of um rust or chocolate spot on them at all um and it was only really by the time the oats started to senesce that any sort of chocolate spot or any rust came in to the oats at all um so yeah i mean they just look healthy you'll see in all these photos every crop just looks ridiculously healthy and bright green um next So vetch and barley, um, this was again similar to the oats. Uh, the vetch wasn't as thick as it should have been. And you can see the barley there does look a little bit stressed because it hasn't had any nitrogen and it has been no tilled. Um, and barley does suffer if it doesn't have that early nitrogen in the spring. But yeah, I, I didn't think barley would be too suited. It does need that nitrogen. And as you can see, it does look stressed and small in the the leaves are quite curled, as you can see there. Next, please. Peas oilseed rape. So this was an interesting one. The oilseed rape at the start looked a lot better with the peas and the oats than it did with the beans and the oats. I don't know why, but they were just bigger, bolder, looked a lot, well, healthier and further on compared with the beans, to be honest. Um, and then as you can see here, the peas started growing and got to about four foot tall and they really shaded out the oilseed rape and kind of left it behind. Um, and it really wasn't until, I suppose, sort of early, early August, late July sort of time when the peas started to senesce uh, and they started to lie down a little bit that the oilseed rape really managed to get going and break through the canopy. Um, this also meant that the oilseed rape started to mature a lot later. So again, similar to the with when, when it was with the beans in the other field, it was a pain um, flowering when we were trying to combine it. But as the peas were the main crop, we just went ahead and did it because the peas were about to fall out of the pod. Um, so as you can see, I wasn't much of a fan of the spring oilseed rape in any of the plots. Next, please. So peas, barley, mustard. This is the three way plot in the second field. So as you can see, look absolutely beautiful. 
um, did quite well. There was only a little, uh, a little amount of barley in here, but compared to probably what the next slide is, which is peas and mustard, there was a lot less weed pressure. And that is something that I did notice throughout the, all of the trials is where was a cereal present? It seemed to limit the amount of weeds that were present during that plot. And you could see that to the line where the trials were side by side. Um, but yeah, no, it, it performed well. It was an interesting plot as well. Um, and yeah, mustard always looks good. Next, please. So peas, mustard, as you can see again, beautiful looking plot, absolutely full of pollinators. I don't know why, but mustard just seems to flower for months on end. I mean, the mustard I've got in my cover crops has been flowering since the start of August, to be honest. It seems to come out of the day and within two, two weeks it's flowering, it's mad. Um, again, this was probably one of my favourite plots throughout the entire year. The mustard just seems to do really well. I don't know why. and it was quite useful in regards to the peas holding it up. Um, so the peas using it as a bit of a scaffold um, did suffer a little bit more weed pressure than when it had barley in the mix as well. But this is something I'm definitely going to continue in the future. It just looked brilliant throughout the whole year, really. Next, please. And so this is the final plot in that second field. So this plot again did the um, did the uh, the headland. So it made up the balance of the field. So all those previous crops were either in a 24 or a uh, 48 meter strip. Um, and this made up the balance in the rest of the field. So again, there will be a yield penalty on this because it includes the headland. Um, but yeah, performed well. The same with the other barley plot. It does the barley does seem to lack in those early stages when it doesn't have that mineralization or that early nitrogen. And I think it only really starts to pick up towards the end of the crop where there might be some nitrogen sharing between some of the legumes, but I don't know the specifics on that. But um yeah, so that'll be for the final plot. Hopefully I've given a fairly quick rundown of everything that was involved um, onto the results. So next slide, please. So this is that first field I said, which is mainly beans and oats. As you can see up in that, in the top left picture, the lighter green one is the vetch and oats. The one to the left of that is the beans and oilseed rope and you can't see but there's a 24 meter strip again to the left of that which is the three-way mix with the beans oats and oilseed rape and then the beans and oats the boats makes up the majority um from the bottom left pitch you can still see some a little bit of green in that mainly bean and oilseed rape photo where it's quite dark brown um but it just shows you how we harvested it at kind of one by one so results um as these were drilled later ish it didn't do as well as what i was hoping so you can see the combined outputs i mean the beans and obviously drape was the worst one as expected it became very weedy and it was effectively just a monocrop of beans which didn't really get any help um and the best performing one in there was the vetch and oats so for the price, um, I've put basically what we have sold them at or the neighbour has sold them at. Um, the neighbour has given us figures for their beans and their barley. And I've put at the bottom, you can see the bottom slide there, our conventional um, oats and conventional peas. Um, just to give you a bit of a comparison on a conventional crop, and obviously the oats and the barley, um, they have had nitrogen. You can see there that my oats that I've drilled conventionally, they had 80 kilos of nitrogen plus some farmyard manure as well, uh, plus a herbicide and all the rest of it. Um, so you can see disappointing yields on most of these, but promising. The vetch I have put in at a price of one and a half thousand pounds a tonne. 
and that is basically half what I would be buying it in as cover crop seed. So all of these crops are either a cash crop or can be used as cover crop seed. So I'll be doing the same with the mustard as well, because um, that's what I'll be using it for as cover crop seed or as in you know, a winter bird seed, for example, birds food mix, for example. Um, and I thought that was the only fair way of doing it. I wasn't going to put the vetch in at £3,000 a tonne, what I buy it in for. But I thought if I put that in at half price, um, I thought that was fair. So as you can see, the vetch notes didn't do too, too brilliantly, really, from what I was expecting. Um, I thought they would have done a lot better, but the vetch, it just wasn't drilled thick enough. And I think if you had a, a, a thicker bit, I mean, that was yielding. It was yielding way, way thicker in that um, in the plot that was six meters um, that was drilled too thick. But yeah, so I mean, it's not a bad. None of them are really a bad margin. You can see the beans and oats is quite low because you can see it includes the headland yield um, as well. But if you compare that to the monocrop beans at the bottom, uh, neighbors results. Um, that was only a gross margin of 328 and that was conventionally with herbicides and fungicides and um, I'm not sure the exact specifics but he's given me his gatekeeper figures um, but then compared to my monocrop um, oats which yielded quite well and I've got a decent price this year none of them particularly look that interesting in regards to the intercrops but you have to remember that all my intercrops have had absolutely zero inputs um, compared to those oats which have had herbicides and obviously all that nitrogen and muck so yeah not as great as i was hoping but i think if one one note to make the the conventional oats were drilled in mid-february as well so it would obviously yield a lot higher um, compared to late april but it is what it is. I thought it'd just be good to give a comparison of conventional crops elsewhere or at least nearby. So next slide, please. So this is the other field you can see. I think it goes. So five, six, seven, eight, I think that goes right to left on that on those two pictures. So the very light coloured strip that is vetch and barley. And then to the left of that peas, obviously drape and then three way mix, um, as you can see there. There is a bit of a wet spot in that field and it is a bit heavy. As you can see, the grass corn has been taken out and there is a, a bit of a, a leak or a heavy spot that always runs through that field. Um, but again, if we run through those, the veteran barley, I mean, did all right, was one of the lowest lowest in that field i think barley just suffers without early nitrogen i've said it plenty of times but i think it's not it's not a great crop in a very low input system and it's also not a great crop in a zero till system um the peas and oil seed rape did surprisingly well to be honest um i'm not sure why because the oil seed rape didn't really yield at all but the peas seem to <laughs> just want to grow and did 3.35 tons a hectare as you can see um but next in the following crop next to that the peas barley and mustard the peas didn't do as well they obviously had extra competition potentially from that barley um see the barley only did 0.57 tons a hectare um but still a decent decent combined output on all of those and i mean a gross margin of almost a thousand pounds a ton is absolutely nothing to be sniffed at um and next to that my favorite crop so far and i think is one i'm definitely going to be carrying on in the future is the peas and mustard and you can see there the peas did all right same yield as the peas mustard and barley um but the mustard did a lot better obviously um and again i've put that as a pounds per ton of half half what i would buy it if i wanted to use that in a cover or a catch crop and then the peas and barley which as i said majority of that is headland didn't do as well this field is a little bit tight and has been cultivated post harvest before the wheat um so it just looked thin throughout the year so I mean, it doesn't really show as well what peas and barley can do. There obviously is a U of penalty being on the headland, but it is what it is. Um, so comparing that to the 
monocrop peas and monocrop barley in the conventional system at the bottom. Um, this was the best yield we've ever had on peas, as you can see, uh, 3.78 tonnes a hectare on some very light ground, which is really suited for peas, which is annoying because it makes my peas and mustard not look as good. Um, but it was grown with a, in a very low cost um, system, as you can see, only £207 a hectare on the variable costs. Um, but yeah, so it has it has done a, a brilliant gross margin there. But the barley, so the neighbours conventional barley, um, I think you can just see with the variable cost there, it's really bringing it down £500 a hectare. Um, and it does have an output of just over 1,100, almost 1,200, but it just brings it way down. Um, and as that should be a cash crop rather than the break crops, not brilliant, um, especially with 120 kilograms of N. But I mean, that's the system. Um, I think my trials have shown that it obviously wasn't a good barley year as well. Most of my barley hasn't performed that well. Um, so yeah. All of the all of the plots were about what I expected, really. Um, I didn't think the headland impact would have had as much of a impact on yield as it did, but it obviously does. Um, the cereals definitely do impact yield, but they do have a weed suppression element as well, which is what I've mentioned. So it's a really fine balance between getting that right and it's something I'm going to have to work on in the future um but yeah so future plans um all of these crops um have obviously been harvested and they're all going to be followed with a winter wheat so it'd be interesting to follow that winter wheat it's been blanket treated across all those two fields so it'd be interesting to see whether there's any differences in establishment or tillering or or yield compared to what the previous crop was for example should be able to see that quite easily um i just want to talk about the cleaner as well so to get in a color sorter would have been 200 250 pounds an hour and considering these are all little plots and there'll be a lot of logistics and loading trailers and they're all smaller tonnages that uh, christ that would have been a hell of a cost so we have a rotary sieve pre-cleaner on the farm it's about 20 something years old um it's got so three three sieves it's got on it and we managed to clean everything except for the two plots that had the vetch in so the vetch and barley and the vetch and, uh, and the vetch and oats because they're too similar sized um which was annoying but everything else has been cleaned and has been put over a way bridge so all of the yields and tons per hectare are pretty accurate um in regards to the barley and vetch and the oats and vetch I uh, um it's not too much of an issue I'm using it as an opportunity what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using that the vetch and barley and using the oats and vetch and that is going to be my seed for my spring barley and my spring oats next year so I'm just going to keep the vetch in it and I'm going to plant them as is and they I would just to get that um that companion cropping payment through the SFI that 55 pounds a hectare um so yeah it was a little bit of a pain and i pro and probably could get a color sorter to just sort those two plots out but i thought i'll just drill them all together and because it's what i probably would be doing anyway um in regards to doing all the cleaning it took 36 hours in total to do all of those um other seven plots that got done um and that was 37 tons in total um so bringing that to a per hectare cost that's cost 45 pounds a hectare in regard that's charging it at 20 pound a hectare for a man and machine 20 pounds an hour sorry for man and machine so 45 pounds a hectare isn't that bad um especially considering they were all little um plots so the majority of the time is setting up the sieves and stuff to do those individual bits once it's got going if you had a large amount of say one crop it would obviously be a lot less um and as i said many times my favorite crop was the peas and mustard 
So I will be doing that next year, but um, Jerry talked about the SFI. I'm going to be trialing something over three fields. I'm going to be trying to get the num three payment. So that is the legume fallow payment, the one year legume fallow payment on a peas and mustard crop. So for the prescription, you need six flowering crops. So my peas and mustard are going to be two of those flowering crops and I'm going to be using four smaller clovers um, as well through that mix. Um, so that should be six crops in total and I'm going to drill it um, hopefully early April, aim to harvest it um, and not ha hopefully the peas don't go flat. Mustard I'm hoping will hold them up. So yeah, hopefully get a yield off of those two crops as well as the £593 a hectare for the legume fallow. So I'm going to trial that next year, this year coming, and see if that works. Um, I don't know if it will or not. I need, I'm going to do three fields. Um, so we'll see. That's my next plan um, before I go back in year three with more crops that do well. Um, so I'll probably go for about five, five different intercrops. Obviously, spring or seed rape, as you guessed, won't be included, but um, I'll do a larger area and get some more data, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, answering, ans asking, uh, answering questions. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Jerry or yep. Laurie, read those out. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. We've got a few questions, actually. Some of them are um, slightly generic, but um, question yeah. about all seed rape. Right, initially, some specific ones. Um, the all seed rape, particularly from Doug, was basically, do you think it actually brings something to the equation, right. even though it's not necessarily financial as a thing? But also, what about varieties? Did you use a hybrid? What did you use? Would a hybrid be better um, as, a, as a crop? Um, and Doug's particularly prominently said it's seed costs are small for an obviously rate, particularly if home saved, and it's very but it's yes. also very year specific. Um yeah, so kind of kind of two arguments to that. The variety we used was Fergus, which was basically the only conventional variety that I could get and is expensive. Um 14, 14 pounds a kilo, I think it is. Yeah, I've got that in my cost. 14 pounds a kilo. Um, basically wanted to use the conventional because I'll be able to home save it and reduce that cost. Um, but as I'm only going to be doing it for one year, I'm not going to do it again. Can't be bothered. It was rubbish. Um, probably wasn't too much of an issue. But yes, potentially a hybrid would do better, would grow faster. But would it need more nitrogen or similar amounts of nitrogen? Would it still have the same problems? I don't know. Um, but it could potentially perform better, as you said. And does it add something to the equation? Yes, definitely. Um, definitely increases diversity. Can't be a bad thing. Um, it's not a mycorrhizal host, as you probably know. So no, nothing in that regard. But I don't know. I do think it does provide something in terms of diversity. But how you quantify that, I do not know. OK. Um, right. Um, I think you've picked up one of the questions here uh, because one of the questions was, but actually the separation and you, you've you've talked about the fact you were going to separate out um, and yeah. some you couldn't keep back as home safe safe. So I think we've covered that one. Um, you use a well a min till stroke no till system here. Um, do you think um, whether in a plow based system would make any difference at all to this? Um, I know it would have to cost and all the other questions, but really just from the from the cropping point of view, do you think you need to be a no till min till for intercropping with the small seeds particularly to work? Uh, I don't think particularly. Um, I wanted to do it as a no till system because I mean, I drill as a no till drill and it's got three hoppers so I can, yeah, can, do. can do all the different seeds. Um, I don't think it is necessary. Mostly wanted to do it no till because I wanted to limit the amount of weeds that would come up. Um, but if you didn't have the option of glyphosate, for example, then not against ploughing if you're on a plough based system. I think for this to work in regards to weeds you've got to be one at the other do it the no-till or do it the plow base because i think the min till it would encourage more weeds at drilling 
Um, but I don't think either is necessary, to be honest. Um, I think you can do it what suits your system. Um, also, um, hoes or harrows, rakes, for example, can be used in either or system um, if needs be. OK, um, Richard has highlighted a point that I was going to make about your potential legume value is how can you going to harvest a crop which is classed as a legume fallow because the rules don't allow it to be harvested other than top for grass weed control so i wonder what, if you had a way around that one or were you just pushing the boundaries i'm pushing the boundaries as long as i'm meeting the aims <laughs> and objectives yeah don't know we'll see it's a trial yeah. i might not be i might not even be able to harvest it um yeah yep. if i can it's a bonus if i can't it is what it is yeah um, okay um Again, and not really a specific one to you, maybe a one to open out a bit more to the to the people listening in, because I don't know whether your facts qualified is um, fertilizer policy and particularly, I'm guessing, P and K um, fertilizer applied to a legume crop um, and the, the sort of RP209 guidance on fertilizer and legume crops. If you any comments. Um. Well, I, I don't put any nitrogen fertilizer on the legume crops because um, you can't and I yep. wouldn't anyway. Um, I am fact I am facts qualified um, in regards to P and K. Um, we haven't used any solid P or K um, applications in about 20 plus years because on the farm we are straw for muck on basically all cereal straw um, with two local beef farmers. Um, so the straw for muck deal with them. Um, do occasionally use some foliar P and K on a wheat crop, for example. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, did I say that I put some nitrogen on a pulse? No, I don't something? think you, you didn't. No, you didn't. I think it was a more of a general fertilizer, and I was expanding it a bit. Um, okay. From a practical point of view, though, and this is a question from the you know quite a valid question: is how do you uh, what would you do as a fax advisor then? in terms of P and K rates for a mixed crop, where do you think the guidance allows you to go with that? Because if you know the recommendation is mm. a certain amount of P and K on a cereal crop, which is not necessarily the same as on a legume crop. Um, so the way that I treat my into crops is I, I try and keep them as a break crop but I try and have one crop as the sort of the main crop in the mix and then the other one as sort of the bonus. So, for example, with the beans and oats or I don't know, the peas and oilseed rape, for example, the peas and the beans, they are the main crop. They're the highest seed rate. An example with the, the additional oats or the additional oilseed rape, if I can get those to harvest, that's the bonus. That's what I'm after. So. And I think from your your slides earlier, Jerry, it, it showed the best yields is when the um, the pulse or the break was effectively the main crop. And then I think it was wheat, the additional crop that was almost the bonus. So I think that is the best way to treat into crops, in my opinion. So the P and K, you would adapt it to to suit what the main crop is in the mix, for example. And I did see someone just put on the chat they fertilised. I think it said beans and oats, and they said they were just fertilising the oats. But I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> um, actually, to point out at this point that the Reading University trials, as part of the leguminous project, are actually looking at fertiliser rates on the intercrops to see whether that has any effect on yield. Mm -hmm. um, and to a certain extent, because of the lab stuff that's going on, I think they'll be able to look a little bit of where sources of N came from in the production. Um, Doug has also asked sulphur. Um, are sulphur applications needed? Um, that's becoming, I know, quite a, a limiting um, mineral, particularly as we've now got cleaner air, yeah. we've less, got less sulphur. Is Again, I, I'm not being an agronomist. Um, I'm assuming sulphur as an application is allowed, but is advantageous for the pulses anyway? Um, yeah, I suppose it probably is, but is it needed every year? Probably, yes, it is as well. Um, and I mean, for most of my crops, the sulphur comes alongside a nitrogen or a urea, um, or as a foliar, it comes in the form of bitter salts because um, we are quite high pH um, lime, limestone. Uh, based soils so we do apply a lot of sulfur 
um because we need it and i'll be honest i just seen jonathan's um messages come through we didn't do any sap tests or leaf tests throughout um probably should have done but there was enough enough going on um yeah i'd say they probably would need it um but yep. yeah i would do it, i would do it as a folia to be honest do it in the form of bitter salts or something alongside do some other folia after a, a leaf test or a sap test and maybe some folia around if you wanted to i think that would be the best way to do it yep. in my opinion um, I'm aware that from a practical point of view, some of the agrochemicals or the options are not permitted on some of the mixtures. So obviously anybody yeah. applying needs to be taking, um, uh, definitely taken into account. Um, equally to picking up on that question from Jonathan and also a question from Laura earlier on, um, one of the of the people involved in the trials, some of the trials we will actually be, um, be doing more um, in-depth assessments of the intercropped and the non tropped plots so looking at the um the beneficial insects looking at the predatory insects so they're looking at plant health aspects and growth of individual plants within the plots um and so we because we got a degree of flexibility in this trials it would be quite interesting doing some sap tests throughout the year on some of the plots as well so that's something i will build into what we try to do for next year i know tom and john are listening so be warned um, and yeah, Joe's mm -hmm. comment there, obviously a, a spring sown, a February sown crop, particularly this year is always going to do better than an April sown crop because April went straight into dry weather, didn't it? So that was a problem. Yeah. Has anyone any following further questions um, that we've nothing left on the chat? Um, if there's anyone got any more questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to answer the question from um, Laura talking about the beneficials. Yep. Um, we didn't we didn't do any surveys on any of the insects or beneficials, but I mean, if you went out on a hot summer's day in the July, the trials were absolutely full. It was almost like you were trying to swap things away. It was quite unbelievable, actually, the amount of insect life that was in those trials and also the beneficials of hoverflies and ladybirds, for example. Um, I mean, we do a lot of we're in the SFI pilot and about 10 to 12 percent of our land is in in an environmental scheme taken out of production for um uh flower flower plots or for um winter bird food for example so i mean we've got plenty of that around in the farm but these these two fields they were absolutely alive with insects and i don't I, i'm not very good at my insect id i would <laughs> but um i would imagine that i would like to think that the majority were beneficials i would at least hope so um but yeah, no, they were alive. And yeah, I think they're just the diversity and all the different flowering crops um, at the same time definitely helped with that. OK, um, going to go for. One of the things that's we've talked about within the project is that we always presume that we're going to be drilling all of the intercrop mixtures at the same time. Have you considered mm -hmm. um, that using drilling at two different times? So winter oil seed rape. Um, obviously performs better than spring, but actually mm. one of the things that's been talked about is actually direct drilling a pea in in the spring into a growing wheat crop because mm. we don't have a reliable winter pea variety in the UK at the moment. Is that something that you would think you would consider? Yes, and it's something I've done before. Um, in some of my previous years, I did peas and oats for a few years. Um, in the first first year I did peas and oats because the varieties they didn't quite mix up um, we kind of lost our bottle a little bit and we had to desiccate those crops because the peas were ready and the oats were just way too far off um, so in the in the second year the oats were drilled first and then about 10 days later drilled the peas into it um, at the time we had a, uh, a Vadastad drill and um, so when we did come back in the second drilling, it did disturb those oats quite a lot and it knocked the oats um, that were just all poking through. They're just about an inch tall. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a consideration, but you just have to be mindful of damaging that current crop. And also it's another you'll you won't just be germinating that crop you're drilling. You'll be germinating weeds as well. Um, so yeah. just consider those two points. Yep, absolutely. That's a risk. Um, a 
question from Jessica, broader question. Um, does anyone have experience of intercropping for whole crops? Um, I think the answer, a lot of farmers, organic farmers certainly do. A lot of conventional farmers now do as well um, in two ways. There's a lot of spring barley and, and peas are grown for a whole crop for dairy rations. Um, um, and beans are probably less common because they're not quite so easy to do in soil. Um, the other one that I am following with some interest, Maize Growers Association have done some work with intercropping maize and effectively runner beans to um, increase protein level of the maize because the, the runner beans grow up through that. So yes, there is a lot of experience. A couple of the seed companies actually do supply mixed seeds specifically for whole cropping. Um, um, but Western seeds, it's called combi crop, and they actually show some pictures of it either being whole cropped or being combined, depending on what your requirement is. So, um, very kind. Um, Doug has asked, I think, Doug, can you, what variety of peas and vetch you used? Um, did you have you? Did you try comparing different varieties in the trials? Was it what an effect in a way? What was your selection criteria for that? And and um, varieties were effectively selected, so they complemented each other in kind of a it was kind of a balance between complementing each other in disease risk wise, but also having a similar sort of maturity. Um, so the peas varieties that we used, we had home saved blue time peas already. Um, so we wanted a similar maturity to those. So we also use Carrington as well as Aviator. Those were the other two peas um, in the mix. Um, and no, didn't do, didn't compare different varieties, just used it as a variety mix. I thought the trials were as, were complicated as enough um, as it was. Um, vetch seed, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head what the vetch seed was. It wasn't like a, I don't think it was a winter hard, I can't remember if it was a winter hardy vetch or not. I don't think it was a hairy vetch. Um, I can't remember without looking up to you. I'll, I'll message you or something if I can find it. But it was um, it was bought through Ian Gould at Oak Bank. Um, so I'll get back to you on that one, Doug. All right, I'll write it down so I don't forget. OK, uh, we've got a comment from Stephen to say that he's tried climbing beans and maize and he gave up because bean seed fly caused the problem. So obviously, Maize, mm -hmm. I guess, is not one of the best um, crops for um, harvesting beneficials because it's quite a big monoculture and, and sort of not um, maybe isn't providing food sources for the beneficials. So interesting comment anyway. So nothing yeah. is perfect in this world. Yeah. Um, if we have no further questions, um, thank you, Ben. Um, really, really useful. Um, insight into what you did really really open and honest um comments and questions and i know you've been very good at doing farm walks and being interviewed and there's interviews all over the place and youtube videos <laughs> so if anyone wants to catch up on what ben's been doing go to his youtube videos um I, they're really sort of again very much like today very open very honest showing what's good what's bad um and really really good that people are trying stuff and then being open and willing um to um to demonstrate and talk about it because the fact mm -hmm. is we could all do something that goes wrong and we just keep quiet about it and someone else will do it wrong next week and um we could all learn from each other so that's yeah. actually brilliant um yeah. i just want to finish off as i said unfortunately the speaker who was going to speak about the varieties specifically hasn't been able to um come today after all and we haven't been replaced so um we're just going to sort of wrap up earlier than we'd said because obviously even though the weather's bad people have got stuff to do um, and we could talk all day on this. I um, just want to, as part of the um, research team, as part of the Leguminous Project, um, Reading University have um, appointed um, a postdoc to be part of the research. She's a researcher and I've just asked her to, Imelda, just to um, introduce herself to everybody and give some idea of the sort of things she's been doing. And um, part of the basis of what we're doing with Leguminous is yes, there's farmer knowledge to be learned, but the researchers can benefit um, from knowing what farmers want. And so I just sort of hand over to Imelda to um, just introduce herself and a little bit of the stuff she's done. OK, so Imelda, over to you. Yes, hello, thank you, Jerry. Sorry, I'm trying to share my, uh, my slides. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're there. 
Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we can. I, am I in, in full um, mode? Can you see? We can okay. see your we can see your um your slides. Yep. Yep. yep yeah. And the cursor. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to introduce myself today. Um, so yes, yeah, so I will give a brief sort of introduction to myself and uh, my educational background. Uh, what I did during my PhD because it was on intercropping, and also what I would um, like to like the I would like to get your input in the research we're going to be doing in leguminose as well. So, sorry. all right. So quickly about my academic background. Um, I did my uh, degree uh, undergrad degree at the University of Aberdeen, and during my um, education there, I had the opportunity in 2017 to do uh, an internship at the Radamstedt Research. And it was a really interesting project uh, about remote sensing. And we were trying to see if we could use uh, basically satellite data to predict uh, crop um, evolution, but also soil properties like soil moisture, etc. And it really got me into uh, interested in actually collaborating between scientists and, and farmers. And I also worked um, on my honors project was looking at uh, phosphorus acquisition in land grace bare barley. And I thought it was really interesting that in Scotland, there were still these land races being used and they have the potential to solve some of the problems we have with, uh, we're countering with climate change, for example. And I had the opportunity to present that work in parliament. And then I started my PhD in 2018 at the James Hutton Institute and uh, University of Edinburgh. So I was based at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen. And this is, uh, my project was exploring plant or interactions in cereal legume intercropping. And I will talk to you about it in a minute. And then recently I started my postdoc at uh, the University of Reading as part of the leguminous project. And the, Jerry, Jerry introduced that project earlier. All right, so just going back to my uh, lab-based research on cereal legume intercropping at the James Hutton during my PhD, I used, um, I selected basically uh, barley and pea intercropping based on research that had been done there before looking at different barley and pea cultivars and just trying to see which ones perform better in an intercropping system. Um, some of you might know Adrian uh, Newton and Ali Kali, they did that research. So I kind of followed up and selected uh, the KW uh, Sassy uh, P and, and Sakura because they were a combination which was sort of, um, they were in, in, they were not excellent intercropping, but they were not the worst. So it was somewhere in the middle. Um, and I used soil, so I was using these pots and the soil I used was again from the James Hutton Institute in Dundee. They have a, a research farm there and uh, half of the, on the same plot, half of the, the, the soil is, is conventionally managed and the other half is managed in integrated management, what I called sustainable management, just it's easier for my presentation. I was able to grow these um, crops only in in the sort of vegetative stage uh, growth because I had to put them in a growth room and uh, they, could, they, they could only reach a few, a few weeks um, or months old. Um, and something I want to mention that was re I thought was really interesting, I read also about uh, tradition in Scotland of intercropping uh, beans and oats or peas and oats in this system called the mushroom. Maybe some Scottish farmers among yourself might talk, might know about this already. Um, and so just to give you a quick background in, in sort of why, the reasons why I wanted to research plants or interactions in intercropping is because a lot of the research in intercropping has actually focused on plant-plant interactions. So for example, uh, looking at competition, for light, for example, cooperation in terms of nutrient acquisition, and also other types of complementarity between the two crops. And there were fewer research in looking at plants or interactions. And I think plants or interactions are really important. Um, and by that, I mean that 
the fact that plant roots are going to influence my soil microbial communities and the activities, and in turn, the soil microbial communities are also going to influence plant health and productivity. I think it's really crucial because these interactions do affect nutrient availability, carbon sequestration, um, soil aggregation, and other multiple soil processes that support the functioning of soils in general and soil health. So another quick note, so, so one of the things that I was interested in, and I think one of the things I really find fascinating is that a lot of the sort of carbon um, fixed by plants through photosynthesis, about up to 20% of that carbon is licked in, in the soil in an area called the rhizosphere. And it's like a hotspot of microbial activities. And that's kind of where a lot of the sort of plant nutrient acquisition and a lot of other important mechanisms for plant plant health happen, and and this this carbon is then uh, leaked in the form of root exudates, which are energy rich and very easily decompos decomposable by the microorganisms, and it fuel a lot of the soil processes performed by soil microorganisms, such as the, the turnover of soil organic matter, which again is really at the foundation of soil health. And so I wanted to know whether intercropping would basically modify. So in the rhizosphere, we have the microbial community here. I wanted to know whether crop diversity was going to modify the microbial biomass size. And studies have shown that it actually does the composition of the microbial community. But more crucially, is crop diversity going to change the way microorganisms function? And I was most in, interested in looking at the decomposition of soil organic matter. This process is really important because in the short term, it affects nutrient availability to plants. And in the long term, it affects soil organic matter um, formation and, and uh, decomposition as well. Um, and so I thought it was really crucial to know how that happened in intercropping. So what did I found? First of all, I found that yes, intercropping does modify soil processes uh, driven by rhizosphere micro microbes. Uh, I found that um, in general, intercropping increased the, the soil microbial biomass. I also found that um, although the, 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 the composition of the microbial community didn't change, so for example, the fungi to bacteria ratio was the same, there was a change in the composition of the microbial community active in using what I mentioned earlier, root exudates. And so overall, there were changes in the modification. So intercropping changed the microbial activities. For example, microbes increased their utilization of root exudates. They incorporated more root exudates in, in their biomass. Um, but they were not necessarily more efficient at producing biomass. Um, so I thought it was quite interesting. And this had an effect on soil organic matter decomposition. Essentially, what I measured was that um, there was a decrease in soil organic matter decomposition. Why? Because the microbes, instead of use, utilizing um, carbon and nitrogen, derived from soil organic matter mineralization, they were using more of the root exudates, especially the nitrogen rich root exudates from, uh, derived from peas. Um, I also measured a, a, a sort of reduced enzy enzyme activity, which also explains why there was less decomposition as enzymes are the um, mediators of soil organic matter decomposition. Um, other findings that I thought would be interesting to mention, um, as I said, I use soils from a conventionally managed soil and a sustainably managed soil. Uh, what I found was that soil management history, uh, so these plots had been managed in, in, in conventional and sustainable management for the last 10 years, um, the soil management had a really big impact on the soil microbial community, so it determined the, the microbial community composition essentially. Um, also, the response, the effect of intercropping depended on soil management, and there was a more a sort of synergetic uh, effect between intercrop, uh, intercropping and sustainable management. By that, I mean the, the reduced tillage, incorporation of organic matter, and uh, so, for example, manure, 
but also um, reduced uh, chemical inputs. And the other thing that I found as well is that in intercropping, and this is not new, the, there was a, um, the legume had a stronger effect on, actually, sorry, it is, the legume had a stronger effect on soil, soil microbial uh, communities, so, and, and also the processes I measured. And this, I, I link this to the greater nitrogen fixation measured in intercropping, which isn't new. And so my take on message really based on the research I did during my PhD is that um, intercropping has the potential to um, a, a positive effect on soil organic matter build up. But more research is required. As I said, I only looked at the, the vegetative stages, um, but this kind of research required further investigation to look at the mechanisms underpinning that, but also look at the long term effects. Um, but also I think that intercropping um, should be adapted in a sort of as part of a, a whole system strategy, balancing different objectives. So on one hand, maybe building up soil organic matter is important, but on the other hand, being able to utilize the nutrients from soil organic matter uh, is also important. So I think it is a balancing act really. Um, and so the, the things I'm interested in is kind of knowing whether whether um, my lab findings are useful to you um, and also what kind of future research could we do to address your needs. And um, I'll just quickly talk about the, the leguminous field trials that Jerry has mentioned before. So these are done at Sonic Farm and we have uh, kind of winter wheat and bean. And then in spring, um, we have wheat and lupin and wheat and soy. And we also have on-farm field trials uh, that uh, Jerry mentioned earlier. And the focus uh, of the, the, the Reading team really is to look at nitrogen benefits of intercropping and knowing, okay, so how much fertilizer to apply on the intercropping as it has been mentioned before and how much fertilizer redu reduction can we gain from intercropping. The second uh, focus is on non-nitrogen benefits. So I'm going to be measuring, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the hypothesis is that intercropping might reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and also things like leach, leachate and, um, and, uh, and other things that I'm happy to talk about uh, later. And in this project, I will have a sort of uh, an opportunity to design experiments with you if, you if you're willing to experiment together. And um, as, as my background is in plant and soil, plant and soil science, um, and also I'm interested in plant soil interactions, uh, I would like to know what you want to know more about or your thoughts about studies we could do together and uh, sort of bringing together our, our expertise to create fun and cool science. Uh, that is useful to you as well. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, if you have any comments, please let me know or put them in the chat. Excellent. That's really brilliant, Imelda. And I think Nigel's comment on the chat was a thoroughly excellent piece of practical and research projects delivered. So I think that's really, it's actually the sort of work that farmers need to know that what we're doing um, is 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 absolutely we need the research to prove that we're right because we know yeah. we're right and we want the research to be proving that this sort of farming system is right thing to be doing so it's absolutely brilliant um as amanda said if you have any areas that you think will be helpful towards this project to her work um, and equally the leguminous project please just get in touch with us either Amelda, um direct through that or to me and i can forward them on um, it's just that we just really like to know how we can work within this intercropping community and develop this knowledge and experience further on. I know lots of work's been done previously. Nikki Cannon's put some links to some work that they did at, Red, at RAU before. And we know this stuff is happening. Let's find a way of proving it because then we can make it more mainstream. Um, thank you all for your time and um, attention today. Um, I argue it's a pretty wet day, but everyone's always got work to do, and I'm glad you all took the time and effort to join us. We will continue to have meetings on farm walks next year. We've got a couple we're lining up. Um, 
as part of the Leguminous project um, and linked into other projects we do. And also we will continue to host web, um, uh, more webinars of this nature, because I think this whole learning from what people are doing is a massive way that we can, can keep progressing this form of farming. So thank you for your attendance. Um, we'll put Imelda's um, email address in, in the chat. Um, I know she had it on the line um, on our presentation. And if you have any questions, if you're in, interested in being involved in the trial, um, if you're interested in just in the project, please get in touch. Keep an eye on what we do through Leguminos uh, website and through Innovative Farmers website where this presentation will be on. So thank you for attending. Have a good day, everybody, and have a good rest of the year. And I hope the weather improves. Thank you for coming. Goodbye.